In this first part, we're going to start with linear regulators because they are both the simplest to understand and also the most commonly used. Then in the second part, we'll transition uh, to the more complicated switching regulators. So this is a, a, a diagram showing the basics of how a linear regulator works. So you, you have an input rail and then you have an output rail. And this is a, a switch or a FAT in most cases. It can be a bipolar transistor also, but in most cases it will be a MOSFET of some uh, type, typically a PMOS, but sometimes an NMOS. And it controls essentially how much, so this one side of the switch uh, of the transistor goes to VN, the other side goes to V out. And the whole regulator works by controlling how much current is allowed to pass from the input to the output through the switch. And it's part of a feedback network. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of, of feedback networks in this course, but it's basically taking a sample of the output and then feeding it back into the, the linear regulator, which then uses the output voltage to know how much to drive this switch or this uh, transistor. So it's basically taking a, a resistor divided version of the output voltage. So you've just got this R1 and R2, which generates a, a voltage here on this adjust pin that's, that scales with the output voltage. It's just a, a simple a resistor divider. And this voltage is then fed into the negative terminal of an op amp. So an op amp, the, the main thing in op amp that, we'll, that you just for, remember for this case is it, it wants to drive its output so that the inputs are the same. So basically what it's, it's going to do is it's going to try to drive this transistor so that this feedback voltage, uh, this adjustable voltage here matches the internal reference voltage of the regulator. So this V ref here is what this is representing. And you'll also, this internal voltage reference for a linear regulator or a switching regulator or pretty much any type of chip that has an internal voltage reference that needs to be accurate will use what's called a band gap voltage regulator. So sometimes you may see this as either VREF or VBG, and I won't go into the, the physics behind a band gap voltage, but it's approximately for silicon, it's about 1.2 volts. It varies between, the, there's second order effects, so it will vary from part to part, but generally this voltage is going to be very close within tens of millivolts of 1.2 volts. So that will set the output voltage because now this is going to be driven to be 1.2 and you just, you scale these resistors so that it gives you the output voltage desired. So let's just say that the output voltage is lower than what it wants to be. So let's just say that this output is supposed to be, let's just say two volts. And let's just, as an example, it's less than that. So that means that this voltage here is going to be less than the 1.2 volts that it should be when the output is at the correct voltage. So this will be one point or less than 1.2. And what that does is that goes into this op amp and it, it will depend on if this is an NMOS or PMOS. But the, the, the essential point is if, if this voltage is lower than the reference, then what it does is it turns on this transistor more. So it allows more current to go from V in to V out and allows the output voltage to increase. If this is too high, if the output voltage is higher, than what it should be. So now this adjustable voltage is higher than 1.2. It does just the opposite. It, it turns this off or reduces the amount of current that's allowed to pass from V into V out. So this feedback loop is what regulates this to always be the desired V out, which is set by just this resistor divider and this adjustable, the, the voltage here that's tapped off of that resistor divider. And that's essentially how a, a linear regulator works. Is it just it's just a simple feedback loop that's regular controlling how much current is allowed to pass from v, the input to the output to give the desired uh, output voltage. There's a few other things we'll look at here on this. This has got an enable pin, which you'll see most regulators are, are going to have an enable pin, and that's if it's it can be positive or negative polarity. But if this is either high or low you can then use that to disable the entire regulator.
So that's pretty much the basics of, there's some control logic over here that's also controlling lots of aspects of this feedback loop, but I'm not going to go into that, but that's the, the basics of how a linear regulator works. So let's now look into some of the, the various equations that, that you'll need to know in order to understand and use linear regulators. And real quick, before I actually leave this slide, I want to specify, in addition to linear regulators, you'll also hear, which linear regulators is the, the broader term, but you'll also hear uh, the term LDO, which is low dropout, is what the LDO stands for. It's just low dropout. So you'll hear either LDO regulator or people just even say LDOs as uh, in replace of saying low dropout uh, regulator. So an LDO is just a type of linear regulator. And the low dropout essentially means that it can operate with V in and V out really close together. So if let's say V in is at five volts, you could have V out at four volts or four and a half volts, four and a half volts. So the difference between V in and V out in those cases would be a half a volt or one volt. So that's considered low dropout. So the dropout is when the dropout voltage is, if you get these two close together, then this device can't operate anymore as it's intended. So it's no longer a current controlled transistor. It becomes essentially a low value resistor. It gets turned on fully, and this just becomes a low value resistor between input and output. And that's not really a regulator anymore. And you lose a lot of performance as you get this dropout voltage or the, the difference between input and output voltages. Those get closer. So really old regulators like a, a 7805, which is just a three terminal uh, five volt regulator that's been around for decades. That is not low dropout. And for those, you, you typically need to have at least a couple volts of headroom. And by headroom, V in has to be a couple volts higher than V out for this device to stay in the correct operating region. The, the problem in what you'll see in the, as I go into some of the equations is a linear regulator is really inefficient and dissipates a lot of power if there's a big differential between input and output. So the old regulators that require this huge differential to operate are shooting themselves in the foot by making it so that they can't operate in the ideal situation for a linear regulator. So if you have to have two, two volts of headroom, so Vn has to be two volts greater than V out, then that's going to be a situation if the current's very high where you're dissipating a lot of power. So normally a linear regulator makes the most sense if it's an application where input and output voltage are really close together or the output load current is really low. Uh, but so that's why linear low dropout regulators are most new regulators are going to be low dropout there since that's the, the sweet spot for a linear regulator to operate is with a, a low amount of headroom voltage between the input and the output. So I just wanted to, to differentiate between pure linear regulator, which can mean anything, or an LDO is a type of linear regulator. And most new regulators or linear regulators are LDO type. Okay, so that's it on this. Let's quickly just review some of the advantages and disadvantages of a linear regulator before we get into the equations. As I already mentioned, it's the simplest to design. It's also the lowest cost and smallest size. So it's got a lot of really big advantages and there's a reason why it's the most popular. So the, the, since it's the simplest and the cheapest and the smallest, this means as long as you can, you always want to try to use a linear regulator. You only want to switch over and use a switching regulator when the linear regulator just doesn't it, it doesn't cut it. Some of these disadvantages are going to come into play. So some of the other advantages are it's low noise. It has a low EMI, electromagnetic interference potential, just because there's nothing switching with a switching regulator, hence the name. There's switching, there's high frequency switching. That switching can feed into other parts of your board and your circuits and cause problems. So that's a, that's an advantage of a linear regulator is it doesn't have that. Also noise. I'm 
noise is such a, a term that can be mistakenly used. I, I'm talking like physical noise. So even something, a, a, a resistor, for instance, has a type of physical noise to it called thermal noise. So a linear regulator is just tends to be a, a much better regulator if you need a, an application where noise is really low and then that can be commonly misunder, misunderstood with high power supply rejection. So power supply rejection is the ability of the regulator to reject whatever happens on the input voltage. So if you have a regulator taking five volts and converting it down to three and all of a sudden that five volts spikes up to six volts briefly, you don't want the output voltage to change. You want the regulator to be able to reject anything that's happening on the power supply that's powering the regulator. And that's what this high power supply rejection means. Whereas low noise is the actual physical noise that the regulator creates, which is much lower than it will be for a switching regulator. And then finally, a linear regulator has a very fast transient response time compared to a compared to a switching regulator. So if the output load is going to is going to increase really quick, let's say you've got some type of pulse load where it's pulsing between 10 milliamps and 1 amp and you want the output to not have any glitches on the voltage or anything like that, then that would be a fast transient response and a linear regulator is going to be the best for that type of application. The main downside or disadvantages with linear regulators is they have very high power dissipation and low efficiency. So the efficiency is a measure of how much of the input power makes it to the output. And a linear regulator is under certain applications is really horrible at this. So you have a huge amount of input power and you only get a little bit out and the rest of it's just wasted as heat. But that is only true if V in is much larger than V out. So it goes back to what we were talking about on the previous slide, this input, this headroom here. As I mentioned, if this gets large, then the linear regulator is not a good up. It's a good, is not a good solution because it dissipates a lot of power in that case. And that's what this is saying. If V in is a lot higher than V out, then a linear regulator is probably not the solution. So if you have a 12 volt input voltage and you're wanting to get 3.3 volts on the output, you most likely would not use a linear regulator unless the load current was really low. And I'll, I'll go into more detail on that in the following slides when we look at some of the equations. But the, the point is that if there's a big difference in the input and output voltage and the current is high, then a, a linear regulator is not going to be the, the best solution. And you'll want to use a switching regulator in that case. And then the other disadvantage is that it can only, a linear regulator can only take a higher voltage and step it down to a lower, lower voltage. So you can have five volts on the input, three volts on the output, but you can't do the other way around. If you have a three volt power supply and you need a five volt supply you, with a linear regulator, you cannot take three volts and convert it to five. That's just not possible with the linear regulator, but it is possible with the boost regulator. You can do a or which is a type of switching regulator. I'll go into more detail in that in just a bit. But the point is if you need a, if there's a, if the output voltage is going to be a lot lower than the input, then you'll want to use a switching regulator. Or if the output voltage has to be higher than the input voltage, then you'll also use a switching regulator. They're just each application will use a different type of switching regulator.